Good evening. We begin the evening news tonight with new developments out of Sugarland, where police have confirmed the circumstances involving the shooting deaths of the Logan family. Investigators say that Richard Logan shot and killed his wife and son in their home in the Greatwood neighborhood, then drove to San Marcos in Guadalupe County. That is where he physically assaulted his adult daughter and then committed suicide. Police tell us a handgun found at the suicide location there in Guadalupe County is thought to be the same weapon used in the murders. We've also learned a memorial service for the family is set for next Monday at River Point Church there in Richmond. Well, now to an ABC 13 exclusive fast moving developments and a story that we first brought you Tuesday when Houston police put out this alert for a wanted suspected serial rapist that led to the arrest of Brandon Carter. Just yesterday, police have tied him to three separate attacks and tonight. We're digging deeper into Carter's past and what we found is very disturbing. ABC 13 reporter Stefania Coley spoke with a woman who tried to put Carter behind bars years ago for another alleged attempted sexual assault. The pattern of accusations against Brandon Carter started in 2011. Carter then was just 20 years old when he was indicted on a charge of attempted sexual assault. In 2012, while out on bond, he was accused again, this time in Fort Bend County. We found the woman who says Carter broke into her home. She had just gotten out of the shower and says she saw a man standing in her living room. I just remember I said, what are you doing here? And when I said that, I knew that there wasn't going to be a good answer. And I ran into my bedroom and uh, he ended uh, he pushed the door down and I fell like on my back and I'm just started kicking and screaming. She tells me it's when she started praying out loud. I was just our father. He took off running. Carter was arrested months later by Fort Bend County deputies for burglary and attempted sexual assault. Meanwhile, his attempted sexual assault charge in Harris County was dismissed. Court documents show it was dismissed because Carter was now charged with a first degree felony in another county, his Fort Bend case. However, that was later dismissed as well. His accusers say they never saw justice. I did everything and, you know, everything possible that I could to try to bring him to justice so that he wouldn't do this to anyone else. Crazy story here. Now get this. Neither Fort Bend County or Harris County could elaborate on the details of why Carter's charges were dismissed, citing change in attorneys since then. Yeah, really troubling to hear some of these details. Tonight at 10, we are going to hear from Carter's 2011 accuser who tells our own Stefania Acoli why she has never been able to escape him. Now to another big story today. Texas EquiSearch joining in Dickinson police with finding a 50-year-old woman who hasn't been seen for nearly a week now. This woman here, Susan Pate, was last seen in Dickinson on February 8th, driving a 2005 black Toyota Scion with Texas license plates of HZN3035. The car has several Houston Texans bumper stickers on the back and side windows. She also has a number of tattoos, including one of a rose on one of her ankles and the letter T on her chest. She is in desperate need of her medication. If you see her, you are asked to please call the Dickinson Police Department. Two brothers now declared innocent after they were arrested in conviction of, dr of drug charges back in 2008, and that was by Gerald Goins. Goins is the former HPD officer at the center of the botched Harding Street drug raid. ABC 13's Maya Shea spoke with one of those brothers as he was leaving court. Ten days ago, Otis Mallet, convicted of a drug charge some 10 years ago, was declared actually innocent here in the Harris County Courts. Today, his brother was also declared actually innocent. Their one commonality, being arrested by Gerald Goins. I think we're all in accord that uh, this case warrants a recommendation of actual innocence. With all the attorneys in the court agreeing, Stephen Mallett finally got something he never thought would happen. Justice. After spending 10 months in jail for a drug charge a decade ago, Mallett was declared actually innocent. 10 days ago, his older brother, Otis was also declared innocent. It took a lot of wear and tear on us. Declarations of innocence post-conviction are exceedingly rare, but more may be coming. That's because the brothers were first arrested on drug charges by disgraced officer Gerald Goins. Goins' testimony at that time sent them behind bars, but now all sides believe he made it all up. The physical evidence didn't test back. There was no DNA, there were no fingerprints, and the only witness that claimed he saw 
each individual commit the crime was going. And this may just be the beginning. The district attorney announcing today it has uncovered 441 cases involving goings from the time the Mallet brothers were arrested to now. Of those, there were 263 convictions involving 234 defendants. All are now under review. It's deplorable, and you hope it's uh, as rare as Kim Og said it is, and I think it is fairly rare. Um, it, at least they're doing something about it. Prosecutors say they will begin reviewing those 263 convictions as soon as possible, and right now they simply do not know how many of those cases will end up in declarations of actual innocence down the road. Reporting from downtown, Maya Shea, ABC 13, Eyewitness News. Maya, thank you. Well, spring training is underway, and for the Astros, that meant starting with some apologies. That's right. Today, team owner Jim Crane and the players held a news conference where they apologized for the first time for their role in the sign-stealing scandal, but they did not apologize for the World Series win. ABC 13's Greg Bailey has more from Florida. Our opinion is, uh, you know, that this didn't impact the game. Um, we had a good team. Moments after he said it clearly to the assembled media, Astros owner Jim Crane was pressed on that belief that the video cheating scheme didn't help decide the outcome of the 2017 World Series. I didn't say it didn't impact the game. Basically, you know, as the commissioner said, in his report, he's not going to go backwards. When Crane stopped talking, his players started trying to walk that delicate tightrope, apologizing repeatedly while insisting the cheating scheme didn't really help. It was just so focused. I didn't really, I don't really hear much anyway. So um, I can't really say it did. I can't really say it didn't. But um, like I said, that's just, that's just me. Carlos Correa offers more details than anyone else, admitting that the infamous trash can that was used to signal hitters was employed during the 2017 World Series. The tension was there, yeah. I mean, if we had a chance, but like I said, I remember them coming using multiple signs, and uh, it was it's, it's impossible to, to decode all those signs. But Correa won't cross the company line that the Astros needed to cheat to win the World Series. When I look back at the playoffs and I look at the games, um, um, it was not affected like in the regular season. Mm, I feel like they're going to be apologizing for a while. Yeah. All right, let's get you caught up on today's forecast. Yes, Chief Meteorologist Travis Herzog here with an update on what we have to look forward to tomorrow, Travis. All right, temperatures diving down pretty quickly this evening through the 40s into the 30s, maybe some frost on the ground to kick off Valentine's Day. Perfect cuddle weather tomorrow. Lots of sunshine, 44 at 9, 54 at noon, 62 degrees will be our high temperature. And then if you're heading out tomorrow evening, it will cool off just as quickly as it is this evening. Now, overnight lows will be near freezing north and west of Houston from Huntsville to Navasota, Waller, Prairie View, over towards Columbus and Wharton. We'll be down in the mid to upper 30s around Houston, Harris County, which that temperature is measured six feet off the ground, meaning at ground level, it's cold enough to get a little bit of frost. The sunshine, though, comes out in earnest. Hardly any clouds in the sky, even less cloud coverage than what we had today, and that's going to push us a little bit warmer into the low 60s, and it won't be as windy as it was earlier. Now, as we look ahead to the weekend, great weather for us, just a 20% chance of a few isolated showers Sunday morning, temperatures in a pretty comfortable range. But on Sunday evening, we'll be watching a new cold air mass diving out of Canada through Montana and bringing some heavy snow showers to parts of the Rockies. That's our next cold front. So as nice as it's going to be this weekend, if you're tempted to put any plants in the ground, I'd hold off at least another week and let's see how cold it gets behind this one because there is more frost and freeze potential. Monday, south breeze brings up the high close to 80 degrees. It's going to be pretty warm and humid ahead of that cold front arriving on Tuesday. That arrives with a band of showers, maybe a few isolated thunderstorms, and and then it just gets a whole lot colder as Pacific moisture rides over the top of the cold air. We get a cold rain Wednesday and Thursday with temperatures likely stuck in the 40s, while in West Texas, perhaps into the hill country, they could be dealing with some snow showers. And historically in Houston, around Valentine's Day is typically the snowiest time of the year. Of course, it's very rare that we actually do get snow in any given winter. So for now, we're thinking just a cold rain for us here in Southeast Texas. So frosty to start the morning. That's about as close as we usually get to snow here. Uh, Saturday looks great. High 65 after a morning low of 39. More comfortable temperatures on Sunday. Extra clouds in the sky and a 20% chance of a morning shower. Very mild on Monday ahead of that strong cold front Tuesday. And after spending a couple of days cold, wet and in the 40s, the sun comes back about a week from now. But with the clear sky at night, we could be right back down into frost and freeze territory. 
As we approach the weekend, we're helping you make those all important weekend plans and avoid big construction projects. The North Loop construction project will close down the westbound lanes of the loop, the Hardy Toll Road to I-45, the North Freeway, four lanes closed, which is very close to a total closure. So you will see backups from Friday night at nine o'clock through Sunday morning at 5 a.m. Your alternate route is cavalcade and we'll be posting more information about the coming weekend closures at ABC13.com. All right, good stuff, Alisa. Thank you. You ready for the catch of the year? Can you believe this? A teen from Needville reeled in a 190 pound alligator gar. Of course, we wanted to know more about this big catch. So ABC 13's TJ Parker has more. This is really for my catfish. Foster High School senior Jack Pytel wasn't expecting to catch what he did with his catfishing pole. I was planning on catch some catfish. I didn't even bring my stuff for gar that night. Jack, though, reeled in a 190 pound, seven foot five alligator gar while fishing with a buddy and his girlfriend along the Brazos River near Needville. It's really cool to catch stuff like that. Something so old too and prehistoric. He's been fishing since he was three and has caught alligator gar before, but nothing like this. I've caught one around six and a half, but nothing to push seven. Jack let his girlfriend try and reel it in. I actually gave her the rod for a minute, try to get her to fight it, and she said, no, this is too much for me. Big fish like this are common in Texas. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department says the state record for an alligator gar catch is 302 pounds, caught back in 1953. So I'll give it a cast out there. Jack is hopeful to one day catch one and beat the record. I'm hoping to, and I'm for sure going to be fishing for more. In Needville, I'm TJ Parker, ABC 13 Eyewitness News. Mm, that's and a big catch. We are still reeling from that story. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? We are still yes. reeling. All right, thanks for getting us <laughs> getting, letting us get you caught up on the evening news. We're going to pull ourselves together, and we will see you back here at 10 o'clock on ABC 13. Good night. Ha, ha, ha.